Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you, Bill. And uh, good morning to everybody uh, on the webinar. Um, this is kind of a new thing for me to do. I've done one other webinar uh, for GIC, uh, I think last year, maybe the year before last. So I'm used to doing this presentation uh, for GIC and also for another other uh, organization, GMA, ACCG, um, GAIS. Uh, and I have been doing it for a number of years now. Um, so it's, it's different to do it in a situation where I'm sitting at my desk uh, looking at my computer as opposed to standing up in front of a, a room full of people. Uh, but uh, I think it works well in this format nonetheless. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, again, I'm Brandon Bowen. I'm an attorney in Cartersville, Georgia. I uh, graduated from the University of Georgia and the University of Georgia Law School um, back in 2001 and came to Cartersville as a as a clerkship and liked the town a lot, so I decided to stay, and that's been 10 plus years now. So um, my firm has always done a lot of local government work, and I cut my teeth doing zoning and uh, health enforcement here in Bartow County uh, for a number of years, and um, got in the habit of really doing it throughout the state when um, unique situations come up. So. Um, I enjoy doing this seminar because it's it's uh, there are a lot of different situations out there that code enforcers and local governments are dealing with. And one thing that I think is interesting about um, this area is that there's no one-size-fits-all solution. Uh, instead, there are a number of tools out there to address uh, differing problems. Every jurisdiction, every city and county is different and unique. And what works for one jurisdiction may not work so well for another. Um, but the law provides a number of different remedies so that you can figure out which remedy is best for your jurisdiction. So with that in mind, I'm going to talk about some of the laws that are out there, some of the ordinances that you can adopt or you can use, and some of the other tools. Um, one thing that's interesting about this area to me I started doing this seminar, I believe, before um, the recession started. And so uh, when we first started, it really was just a matter of talking about how you deal with junky houses and junk cars and things of that nature. And then we started dealing with all the foreclosures. And the next year it was, we don't need help dealing with the foreclosures. We need help dealing with the receivers. And how do we find receivers? And the people who, who uh, either are banks or you know investors from the far side of the country who are buying up houses. Um, so it's been interesting from this perspective to watch the, uh, the economy evolve over the last few years. But uh, again, I'll say um, for every problem, there's generally a remedy out there. It may not be easy, but generally there's a way to get the problem resolved. So I'm going to, with that in mind, I'm going to jump in. I will say this. Um, when I do this presentation live in front of an audience, we generally get a lot of questions, and that's good because otherwise this is kind of like a college seminar that can be kind of boring, um, frankly. Uh, not as boring as some topics I cover. I, uh, I do First Amendment law and sign ordinances for, uh, for our group of a number of entities uh, from time to time, and I always get people who are surprised at how slow that is, but you know, First Amendment law is just pretty dry stuff. This is not quite so dry as that, uh, but nevertheless, it definitely benefits from questions from the audience. I, I find that the jurisdictions throughout the state, um, you know, just see a lot of odd things and interesting things in this area. And you know, if you've got an interesting situation that you've had to tackle, I imagine that there is another jurisdiction on the line who is facing it now or will be facing it soon. So it may be useful for them to hear what um, what your solution was and how that worked for you. So I do encourage you to jump in, and Bill's going to moderate those questions. Um, the only thing I ask is, you know, I can't be everybody's city attorney, so uh, always turn to your city or county attorney uh, for the final word on what you're going to do when you're in this situation. Okay, that's it. Let me, uh, let's jump right in. Okay, um, we're going to be talking about a number of topics. We'll talk about the state minimum standard codes. 
uh, talk about some ordinance provisions, whether it be your zoning ordinance or a nuisance ordinance or unfit property ordinances. Um, also going to talk about the foreclosure registry law, which uh, is fairly new. It's just two years old now. And uh, that's something that many of you probably have or are interested in. So I'll talk about that as well. Um, a lot of times people don't realize this. There are a number of minimum standard codes that are adopted by law. Of course, we're all familiar with the International Building Code. And these others that are listed are the other international codes. Um, I'll be frank with you. I'm a lawyer, not an engineer. I can't really tell you what you know the specifics of each of these codes. They all develop, they all regulate a different area of the um, of the construction um, industry. Um, the important thing is that state law, um, as you see down at the bottom there, eight two twenty, um, has adopted these standard codes, and they automatically apply in every jurisdiction in Georgia. Um, a lot of times jurisdictions don't realize this, but you do not have to adopt the International Building Code. It's already been adopted, um, and it applies in your jurisdiction whether you have adopted it or not. Now, the DCA plays an important role with that. Uh, the DCA reviews the codes and adopts Georgia amendments. Um, and if you go to the DCA's website, you can find all those amendments. But these codes exist in your jurisdiction already without you requiring you to adopt an ordinance. Um, one thing that's interesting, I have had seen uh, this come up before, where a jurisdiction says a particular uh, one of these codes doesn't work for their jurisdiction. And the law allows the DCA to exempt or uh, allow the local government to change uh, a code provision if they can show that there is a bona fide reason why that code provision is not appropriate for their jurisdiction. Um, I don't know a situation where a, a jurisdiction has gone all the way to actually getting the code changed, but I have seen at least in one case where it was, it was tried. And ultimately, you have to convince the DCA that for whatever reason, a particular provision of these standard codes just uh, is not well suited to your jurisdiction. OK, now, while you do not have to adopt the minimum standard codes, you do have to have, or each jurisdiction should have, a building code that talks about the administration of those, of those um, minimum standard codes. And this ordinance will have a couple of important provisions. One, it's going to announce who is in charge of code enforcement. That may be your, your building staff or code enforcer, depending on the situation. But it's going to appoint someone to be uh, the enforcer for these minimum standard codes. Um, it is going to talk about the appeal process. And commonly, what these provisions or what these ordinances create is a construction board of appeals. And to give you an idea of why this would be important, um, you know, imagine a situation where a builder wants to build a, a house, and the uh, the um, building officer for the city looks at the plans and says, "Well, you, you're using a certain type of wood here, and we think." this size wood is not suitable under the International Building Code. If the builder disagrees, what does he do? Obviously, he's not getting his building permit from the building officer unless he changes his plans. Well, your ordinance needs to provide a remedy so that that builder can appeal that decision, that interpretation of the building inspector, to a construction board of appeals, who will then look at it and say, yes, the building instructor is uh, inspector's right, or no, he's wrong, or we think that this this uh, this plan does comply with the International Building Code, or whichever code is is relevant to the situation. Commonly, um, the Construction Board of Appeals will be made up of people who the jurisdiction has appointed, uh, who are builders themselves, or uh, engineers, or architects, people who have an understanding of how uh, these codes work, so that 
they're not looking at it completely green, um, as if you put someone who wasn't experienced in that area onto the panel. Now, I'll say uh, one thing I always like to ask, and I wish I could see everybody now to see, see hands, but one thing I've found is that most ordinances have a construction board of appeal, or most jurisdictions have one, and most jurisdictions have never actually had to have them meet to consider a, uh, an issue. Um, maybe somebody's out there now who has seen it uh, used in their jurisdiction. Um, nevertheless, I think it's important that your ordinance provide for it and provide an appeal right. Now, it does not have to go to a construction board of appeals. You could have the appeal go straight to the city council or, um, or your board of zoning appeals or some other entity that's already been created. But there does need to be a process so that someone who's had their building permit denied because of a failure to comply with the minimum standard codes can seek relief. Okay. <laughs> there are also a number of permissive codes which, uh, with Georgia amendments, that may be adopted if local governments desire. Um, the two I like to focus on are the International Existing Building Code and the International Property Maintenance Code. Um, the International Existing Building Code is really good if, uh, like most jurisdictions around the state, you've got an area of older buildings that were constructed before the state minimum standard codes were adopted or before they were enforced. You've got buildings that don't, that aren't up to snuff with uh, the current building codes. Um, you have these older buildings and then the problem that we see is that people buy them and they want to renovate them and you know enlarge them or add new rooms, modernize them, whatever. And the problem is that the, the wiring in the building is, is old uh, or old-fashioned. Uh, the, the, uh, the construction is old and old-fashioned. It always creates a problem because you know uh, it, it's You've got a situation where you've got a non-conforming structure. Um, to what extent are you going to require that that structure be brought into conformity before you allow people to put a new deck on it or build a new laundry room or things of that nature? So the International Existing Building Code, um, it focuses on what changes need to be made to the existing structure to allow it to be built onto uh, in a safe manner. And so if you've got an area of your city or your county that has a lot of these older homes, um, then, then uh, this would be a good uh, code for you to have. Okay, here are a couple of provisions that deal with uh, maintenance of the structural members of a building, uh, also um, windows and whatnot. And it gives specific language so that the code enforcer can look at a house and say, okay, here's where you have a precise problem and then show that property owner, here's where the code says you have to do this or you have to ma maintain it a certain way. Um, Here's another example of that uh, dictating how um, stairs must be uh, constructed. Um, obviously very detailed down to the number of inches uh, that the stairway must be constructed to, and also including handrails and things of that nature. 
again, this very specific language that the code enforcement officer can look at and um, and show the property owner, uh, as opposed to just being a subjective um, a subjective opinion that you know a stairway is not safe. This is a good one to have here, dealing with rodent harborage. Um, basically, a language that the code enforcement officer can use to require property, and particularly the exterior of property, uh, to be free of um, trash and debris that would that would harbor rats and, and other um, animals. And it gives the code enforcement officer the authority to tell the property owner you've got to have these uh, rodents exterminated. Okay, this one deals with, um, uh, with graffiti, and it actually gives the code enforcement officer the authority to require the property owner of property that has been um, uh, graffitied for lack of a better, I'm not sure what the verb form of graffiti is, but property that's been painted over in a way that creates graffiti gives the code enforcement officer the authority to require the property owner to fix the problem uh, and get it cleaned up. Here are a few more that deal with um, provisions of the International Property Maintenance Code that uh, give the code enforcement officer um, language to use to help get property clean. Um, accumulation of rubbish and garbage, and uh, the more general one just requiring that um, property owners keep their structures and the premises uh, clean, safe, and in sanitary condition. So you can see how each of these provisions would allow uh, code enforcement a lot of tools to be able to show a property owner who has got a dirty property um, how it should be uh, um, how it should be fixed. This one here is probably the most controversial. Uh, requires swimming pools um, to have fences. And I mentioned earlier a situation where a local government wanted to change the code and get the DCA's approval to do that. This is actually the provision they wanted to get changed. Um, they didn't like the idea that, that property owners, particularly property owners, having large lots of land um, and having a pool way off from the road, way off from neighbors, would have to put a fence up. Um, but they ultimately chose not to make that change. Um, and I think this is one of the main reasons is you see new pools being constructed generally always have a fence around them. Obviously, the purpose of this is safety. You know, you can imagine a child breaking onto property or trespassing, getting into a pool and 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 uh, and drowning. So, okay. Now, as, as I said before. Um, Many of these uh, provisions of the International Property Maintenance Code are very controversial. And uh, you generally, well, the International Property Maintenance Code does not apply in the jurisdiction unless the jurisdiction chooses to adopt it. And I have been in situations before where the, the council uh, wanted to look at the International Property Maintenance Code, but the public response was so vehement that they ultimately decided not to adopt it because it, it is so um, it is so regulatory. So a good thing to do in, in that situation is to look at the provisions that you like, the provisions that you do want to have, and uh, just put them in your zoning ordinance um, or any other land use ordinance for that matter. It doesn't have to be zoning. Um, I commonly see them put there, but strictly speaking, it's not zoning. It's uh, land use. So it could be put in your nuisance ordinance or uh, just uh, uh, if you don't have zoning, many jurisdictions still don't, uh, you could just put it in a land use regulation um, and just choose the provisions that you like. In that uh, context, the ones that I think people 
uh, our city is about most often are uh, provisions, ordinances that regulate junk, trash, debris, tall grass, that kind of stuff. Um, junk cars, that's always a problem here in Bartow County and I think throughout the state it, it's a problem. Um, what we commonly do is draft the ordinance so that it prohibits um, cars that are either um, inoperable or untagged to be parked outside. Um, that way, if you've got someone who is uh, saying, well, I'm just working on this car, but it's not tagged, so it would never be operable on the road, you still have that defined as junk. You don't want to just say just junk cars because as we all know, junk is one man's junk is another person's uh, uh, um, uh, treasure. I, uh, I was in a case one time here in Bartow where I uh, was prosecuting uh, a woman who had numerous junk cars and she would not clean them up despite uh, repeated efforts on the code enforcement staff. We had taken her to court and uh, you know, I, I'll never forget, I was having her go through each of the cars, and we had photographs of each car, and get her to explain what it was, and what the problem was with it, and how long it had been there, and we had pictures showing that the cars had been there for a very long time. And we got to a, a Honda that had its hood, it was either all the way up or just completely off, and there was vegetation going all the way through it so that you could see the vegetation through the hood, um, no engine in there. Mm -hmm. And I asked her if this car was operable, and she, her response was, that is a good car. It just needs a new engine. Um, that's what you have to deal with sometimes. So, uh, and in her mind, I know that she uh, believed that was a good car. But from the county's perspective and from her neighbor's perspective, it was a horrible eyesore. So we define cars to deal with whether they're inoperable or untagged. Now, we also normally put in provisions that say, well, you can have one for the purposes of repair for no longer than six months. Or you can, generally, these orders provide that if you put them in a garage, you can have as many as you want, so long as they're not open to the public, you know, being an eyesore. Uh, Brandon, yes. this is Bill. Can I interrupt you for a moment? We. We've gotten a question, and I want to pose that to you. But for those who have joined the webinar since you started, and a number of them, a number of you have, we want to remind you: if you have a question, just type it into the the panel you'll see on your right hand side of the screen, and I'll see the question and I can convey it to Brandon. But we have gotten a question, and and that is from Charles Alford. He's asking uh, what body or or authority establishes the uh, the international building codes. Um. It is the ICC, the International Code Council, I believe. Okay. And uh, I, I don't really know who all is involved. I know they've got a website. You can go look at it. Um, but I think it is uh, engineers, architects, building experts from around the world who, who figure out um, what are the best building practices. And, of course, you know, they serve a very important goal. Uh, we all recall the... Um, the uh, horrible um, storm was it? I mean, well, I can't recall now. Tell me, hey, was there a storm or an earthquake in Haiti a couple of years ago that did so much uh, horrible damage? And the main reason is that the housing there is not built to the standards of the International Building Code. They don't enforce it in in Haiti. Um, having those codes helps prevent things of that nature, and that's the ICC's mission. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, other uh, prisons that we normally put into either a zoning ordinance or a land use regulation, you know, uh, provisions dealing with using vehicles or RVs or storage containers, things of that nature. Um, commonly, you'll see provisions talking about no uh, living in RVs in residential areas, living in tents in residential areas, things like that. People often get um, upset about parking of commercial vehicles in residential areas. So sometimes ordinances will regulate that, require construction or commercial vehicles be parked in side lots or back lots as opposed to front lots. One thing I think is very important to put in these ordinances is minimum fines. Um, well, a lot of times 
I have found that judges don't particularly like fining people a lot for these types of violations. But from a code enforcement perspective, <clears throat> if if there's not some sort of real penalty, then it may be cheaper to not comply than to just pay the fine. Or excuse, yeah, cheaper to pay the fine than to fix the problem. So it is important to put in fines that are high enough that they will actually get the result you want, which is that people will just comply to start with. Uh, another thing that's useful to put in is that the fines accumulate on a daily basis, and then each day is a separate violation. Um, we've had situations before where houses were in really bad shape, and we started compounding the fine. And in one case, in really one egregious case, the, the fines were so much that they were more than the um, house was worth. And so we ultimately sold the property to sheriff's sale to someone who wanted to come in and fully renovate it. So that completely resolved the problem. And the reason is because we had minimum fines that were running on a daily basis. Uh, if you put that in your ordinance, that makes it easier for the judge to require it, um, more palatable for the judge to require than to pay it. Um, you know, there's one issue that I thought I'd talk about. I don't have a slide for it, but um, uh, manufactured housing, uh, that is an area that is commonly a problem, and um, particularly the older manufactured housing. Many ordinances um, that I have seen over the years um, will have language that says uh, no one may get a permit for signing a manufactured house or a mobile home that is more than 15 years old. Um, if you have an ordinance like that, you need to look at that because a couple of years ago, uh, legislation was passed that prohibited local governments from regulating manufactured housing based on the age of the unit. Instead, you have to, you, you can still prohibit manufactured housing and you can prohibit manufactured housing that is in bad condition. But you have to do it based not on the age of the unit, but on objective criteria. In other words, how does it look? How has it been maintained? Is it in good condition? Uh, does it look clean? Um, and you can have other conditions as well. Uh, one thing that we see ordinances put in is a requirement for a masonry foundation, a requirement of slope roofs, uh, minimum square footage requirements. Uh, things like that that basically ensure that only a newer or a nicer, better maintained uh, manufactured housing are going to be able to come in. And there actually is a model ordinance that um, I believe both GMA and ACCG have that creates a mechanism where uh, the local government can require an inspection of a unit before someone brings it into the jurisdiction. So for instance, I've got a manufactured home here in Bartow, and I want to take it to Cherokee. Cherokee could say, well, before you bring that in, you've got to get a permit to come into our jurisdiction, and we're going to have you either make the manufactured home available for, me to, for our inspector to go look at, or we're going to require you to submit photographs, things like that, uh, showing that it's in good condition before you bring it into the county. Um, and obviously the reason for that is you don't want your jurisdiction to be the, uh, the uh, graveyard for the old and run-down manufactured housing. Okay, one of the things that I always find um, to be, um, well, generally sparks a lot of discussion at, at these seminars is the question of who your jurisdiction is going to use as a code enforcement staff. Um, in smaller jurisdictions, it's commonly uh, the, the person that wears the code enforcer's hat also wears the zoning administrator's hat and also wears the building inspector's hat and maybe some other hats too. Um, in other jurisdictions, we'll see code enforcement being performed by a civilian uh, officer who is, who, who um, is not post-certified, or we may see 
uh, in some jurisdictions. I know here in Bartow, we actually have sheriff's deputies that do all of the code enforcement. And there are pros and cons to that. Obviously, um, if if you if your code enforcement officer is wearing a bulletproof vest and carrying a gun, um, it can be intimidating. And that intimidation factor can be good to get compliance, but it can also uh, have the opposite result. It can have the result of uh, of making people fearful to talk to them so that they can't get cooperative responses. And I know many uh, members of GACE, the Georgia Association of Code Enforcers, are civilians and they uh, frequently have a strong opinion that they can get a better result as a civilian um, who works on cooperating with the violator to come into compliance. Now, uh, another thought is, and, and I, I think this is true uh, here in Bartow a lot, a lot of times the, uh, the, the, the code enforcement violation is um, evidence of a, uh, of a problem that has uh, another source. Um, for instance, we may find, you, your code enforcement officer may go in find junk cars and overgrown vegetation, but on further inspection, he may find a meth lab, or he may find um, situations of child abuse or animal abuse. I've had that come up on a number of occasions. In those situations, it's really nice that the officer is a, uh, a police officer or a sheriff's deputy who is able to deal with all of those issues at one time, um, whereas the uh, civilian may walk into a situation that is beyond what he's trained to deal with. So, but that is a situation that can be remedied by having a, a, a close um, relationship between the police department or the sheriff's department and the uh, civilian code enforcement officer. Uh, Brandon, have a question for you. Okay. Uh, from, from Cheryl Fanso, do you have cases where a jurisdiction has both a civilian and post-certified code enforcement officer on staff and how do they utilize both at the same time? Hmm. I, I can't think of a jurisdiction I work with off the top of my head that uses both actively. Um, but I, I know that there are jurisdictions, and it's common, where the civilian police, or the, excuse me, the civilian um, code enforcer has a close relationship with the police officer department, maybe has a liaison, is out inspecting and comes across an issue that requires police intervention, um, it's, there's, there's a quick connection as to, to get that, that type of resource. Um, but I, I, off the top of my head, I can't think of one that uses both civilian and non-civilian. We uh, uh, Unfortunately, it can be a problem if if, uh, you know, I've seen situations where a sheriff's department or a police department basically feels like code enforcement is not their problem. They're going to enforce the state laws, not the uh, city ordinances or the county ordinances, and, and they may choose not to be cooperative. And that is where I think the, uh, the, particularly the elected officials of the jurisdiction need to influence that, um, the uh, police or the sheriff's department to really work hand in hand with code enforcement. Uh, Brandon, we've gotten a couple of responses. Uh, Roger Goddard says the city of Douglas has both, and we work hand in hand, which is good to know. Also, Mark Hawkins indicates that we here in Waycross have both civilian and peace officers doing code enforcement. So those are a couple of examples. And then we've gotten a follow-up question uh, from Cheryl, who raised the original question. Can one be used more for enforcement in the field and in court where the civilian can be used in cases that are not quite as difficult to deal with? Well, uh, Cheryl, I think that's a great, a great thought, a great strategy, you know, for deploying your uh, resources. Um, obviously, the, um, the uh, police officer, the sheriff's deputy, as part of his uh, post certification is trained in presenting a case. Um, so taking that evidence to be able to prove the case uh, is, is something that they are trained before they even become a code enforcement officer. They're trained to do that. So that's great. You know, from a lawyer's perspective, who, and I've put up many of these cases, 
you know, it, these cases should virtually never be lost. If they're lost, it's either because someone is is uh, is acting unreasonably, or um, or there, there was a mistake in putting the case together. So um, having a, a, someone who's trained in putting the case together, as the post-certified officers are generally, uh, is good. On the other hand, um, the peace officer or the civilian can be very good in getting cooperative situations or cooperative results. Um, I, I'll share a story I heard um, at a, one of these seminars a couple of years ago. And it comes from Fitzgerald, Georgia. Um, and the, the, the city manager there was talking about um, their process. And they, they have a, uh, a code enforcement officer that is post-certified. However, he is retired. And he does not you know, carry his gun in the field. He uh, looks like just a civilian as far as his, uh, his appearance when he's out in forces. And when they hire this gentleman, um, they have, um, they actually have an essay test they give to all the applicants. And one of the questions was, what would you do if you came across a situation where um, we've got an elderly lady in a rundown house with a lot of overgrown vegetation? What, and she's not cleaning it up. What would you do? And his response to that, uh, which I thought was great, and that's why I share, his response is, well, first, uh, once I determined that she was not able to fix the problem, I would see if she had any family, and I'd try to get them to fix the problem. And if she did not have any family that could or would help, then I would go to her church and see if her church family would try to would help her fix the problem. And if she didn't have a church family, then I would just go to the churches in the area and see if any of them would try to do it. And uh, if I couldn't get relief then, then I'd just call some of my buddies and we'd go fix the problem. And that is, that mindset, I think, is an important thing that the civilian peace officer can bring to the table, the cooperative remedy to the situation, as opposed to simply saying, you know, you're in violation of the law, and if you don't get it fixed, I'm going to issue a citation. Uh, not every situation will respond to a citation. Um, a citation is great for many situations, uh, but it's not, the, it's not the only way to get a result. And I think that's something that the, uh, the civilian can, can be useful for. Uh, Brandon, if I could just share a little more feedback we've gotten. Uh, Roger Goddard of the city of Douglas has stated that uh, anyone interested in contacting him for more information on how they utilize both types of code enforcement officers is welcome to give him a call at Um, one, a couple great benefits. One, that's how the code enforcement office is going to show to its elected officials um, the value of the code enforcement office, you know, what it's doing to make the city or the county a better place. Two, it's, uh, it's going to allow you to see exactly where all your problems are and what works to resolve those problems. And finally, and from a lawyer's perspective, this is very important. You know, when, if I have to take a case to court and I have to ask the judge to either put someone in jail or to issue a very large fine or something of that nature, I want to be able to show that the city staff has done everything it can do short of coming to court to get this problem resolved. 
Uh, a lot of judges look at code enforcement the other problems they have to deal with on a day in, day out basis, whether it be you know domestic problems or felony problems or things of that nature. And so showing them, particularly when you're in superior court, showing them that you're you really are only there because there's no other there's no other recourse is very helpful. And you know, if we can show that when someone comes up and says, Hey, I just couldn't get around to it to get it cleaned up, when you can show that you have warned them and notified them and you know and talk to them repeatedly over a six month period and they still won't get it fixed, that really undermines their defense. So having a formal system to do that um, I think is very important. Okay. Um, code enforcement uh, citations are more often than not going to be filed in either the magistrate or the municipal court. Um, magistrate court is for the unincorporated portion of the county, municipal court is for the city. Um, these are um, sometimes referred to as the small claims court, uh, particularly the magistrate court. Um, benefits to them are generally you're quick to get someone to court, uh, you get a quick response, uh, it's not expensive. Many jurisdictions do not even use an attorney when they're bringing these cases. They just have the code enforcer handle the prosecution altogether. And generally it's locally responsive, meaning your, your judge is going to enforce your law. Um, let's see. Municipal courts, obviously, again, are in the city. Um, they have the authority to issue uh, fines as provided by the charter, possibly jail time if the charter allows, uh, community service, um, suspended sentence. The suspended sentence is really uh, useful because uh, sometimes judges will say, well, look, I'm going to fine you a few hundred dollars. However, I'll suspend that sentence if you get the problem cleaned up in the next five days. And that can be a pretty effective way to get a problem resolved. Uh, the municipal judge is generally appointed, um, unless the charter says otherwise, and appointed by the city council. Um, generally, we don't have jury trials on code violations. People don't always realize that, though. Uh, magistrate court is your, your, your court for the county ordinance violations, and the state law allows the magistrate judge to fine someone $1,000 or up to 60 days imprisonment for, um, for each citation. Um, also can require restitution, community service, and suspended sentences. So there are a number of punishments available for these ordinance violations. Uh, the chief magistrate is normally elected uh, and he appoints the others generally. Um, now under the law you can take a uh, uh, potentially can take a code enforcement violation to a jury trial on an ordinance violation. Um, don't really see that very often. I, I think it has occurred, but it's not very often at all. Superior Court is the next court up. That is the general trial court for the state. And um, the thing that is really useful for Superior Courts in this context is that the Superior Courts are used to issuing injunctive relief. Generally, the Superior Court is the only trial court that can issue injunctive relief. And by injunctive relief, we mean uh, an order that says someone has to do something, or you have to clean your property up, or you have to fix this problem. Uh, and you can imagine that in a code enforcement situation where you have someone who's very recalcitrant, uh, this can be a good way to get a problem resolved. Um, Having the fines in the ordinance and the punishments in the ordinance, that's really helpful to get the fines that you want from the Superior Court. Um, something that is great, you know, I, I have I've brought many cases in the Superior Court where we find we've got people who we cannot get compliance with from the municipal or the magistrate court. And generally, the judges, in my experience, in the Superior Court are not going to send someone to jail because they haven't complied with the zoning ordinance or the uh, the city's codes or the county's codes, but they will order the person to fix the problem and usually give them a short time period to do it. And if they don't do it, then I have found time and again that the judge will say, well, you're in contempt of my order and they will absolutely throw people in jail for that. And 
that will generally, if you can't make someone clean their property up, putting them in jail will get their family to clean their property up, I've found on a number of occasions. So most often when we bring cases to Superior Court, though, uh, the, uh, the person who's in violation will be standing outside the front door of the courthouse ready to settle on the hearing date. Um, and more often than not, these cases will not make it to the judge at all because we won't have to. Uh, Brandon, we've gotten a feedback from Diane Veal. says she has one that wants a jury trial for working on cars in a residential area. So mm -hmm. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. That's, uh, I don't know. I, I, I would imagine that it would be, well, I think that's going to annoy the judge a lot. <laughs> I would caution them about taking that position unless they're, unless they're right. Um, there are a couple of situations, and I talked a moment ago about the Superior Court having the authority to, uh, to issue injunctive relief. There are a couple of situations where your magistrate and your municipal courts do have injunctive authority. The first is for the abatement of a public nuisance. Um, the, uh, uh, a nuisance is anything that causes hurt, inconvenience, or damage to another. Um, However, it must be something that is going to affect uh, the ordinary, reasonable person. You know, there are a number of cases that talk about how a particular smell or noise or whatever would only bother the fastidious, and there's not a there's not a, a legal recourse for that. The law is not going to fix that problem. Um, but if there is a problem that is uh, bothersome to the community as a whole, then that's a nuisance and it can be abated by an action which can be filed either in the Superior Court or in the, um, um, in the Magistrate or Municipal Court. And importantly, a nuisance can be, uh, a lawful activity can be a nuisance. You know, for, uh, for, for instance, imagine you've got a chicken farm and uh, it's properly permitted to be there. However, it smells horrible and it is running a, uh, uh, it gets established after a, uh, next to a existing neighborhood, and the odor is really bad for that neighborhood. Well, that's a situation where a nuisance could be abated, and the chicken farm operator required to do something to stop the odor, um, even though it is legal to be there. Now, there are private nuisances and public nuisances. A private nuisance is one that affects either one person or a small class of people. That's not what we're dealing with. It's not the local government's um, uh, responsibility or place to address those private nuisances. Um, then there are public nuisances which affect the community uh, as a whole or generally throughout the community. Um, and a public nuisance can be filed by any of the, uh, the city or county attorneys, the district attorney, um, and the statute cited there gives the authority for the magistrate court or the municipal courts to issue to, to order abatement. And by abatement we mean do whatever it takes to fix the problem, to stop the nuisance. So commonly you'll see, and I'm sure if I polled you, we'd find that many of you have nuisance ordinances in your jurisdiction that define um, a variety of things as a nuisance, uh, such as junk cars, overgrown vegetation. Um, barking dogs we hear all the time, uh, things of that nature. But that's one way you can put into, well, let me back up. You don't have to have a nuisance ordinance. You can file a public nuisance lawsuit without a nuisance ordinance. But local governments commonly will adopt a nuisance ordinance and define in there things that the jurisdiction considers to be a nuisance. And that can help you out in prosecuting those cases. Uh, a closely related um, matter is the, um, the unfit property ordinance law. Um, it is very similar to the nuisance abatement statute. The key difference is whereas a nuisance abatement action does not require an ordinance, um, the unfit property law does require the city or the county to adopt an ordinance uh, to use its provisions. 
And I'll talk to you about what those are in just a moment, but I will make one point. This law changed about a decade ago. Um, and before that, well, many jurisdictions had unfit property ordinances before that. And if you did, um, the law specifically says those older unfit property ordinances are still valid. But what I have found time and again is that the procedure in those older ordinances is not nearly as good as the procedure in the new statute and the procedure required by the new statute. So I have on a number of occasions recommended that local governments take their existing ordinance and basically scrap it and uh, pull up a new or adopt a new ordinance that complies with the current statute. I'll talk about what those terms are. Um, now, the unfit property ordinance, it defines unfit property as property which is unfit for human habitation or for commercial, industrial, or business occupancy or use and not in compliance with the applicable state minimum standard codes. Now, it says this, and so many people are of the mind that the, um, the unfit property uh, action is really only going to apply if you have a house that needs to be torn down. And that's not true. Uh, the, the statute also has language in there that uh, specifically says you can use its provisions whenever property is unsanitary or unsafe to persons residing or working in the vicinity. So you may have a situation where a house is not completely decrepit, but has some severe vegetation problems uh, or has some safety issues that need to be fixed that won't require it to be torn down, but do require it to be fixed. And you can use this, uh, this statute, this ordinance, to address those problems. And I think it's very effective in how it does that. Um, first, your jurisdiction has to adopt an unfit property ordinance. And that requires uh, a finding that you have situations in your jurisdiction of blight and also um, commonly references property being used for drug uh, and illegal activity. Um, the ordinance must identify an officer who is going to be the, uh, the uh, enforcing officer under that ordinance. And it provides a, um, a, a detailed procedure for enforcing the ordinance, including notice to the property and things of that nature. OK, so what is unfit for use? Um, well, the, the action begins when the code enforcement officer finds that a building is unfit based on any of these, any or all of the following conditions. Um, so defects regarding fire or accidents, uh, lack of adequate ventilation, dilapidation, disrepair, structural defects, or just general uncleanliness. Now, the procedure is what has changed, as I mentioned earlier, and so I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Um, let me tell you what, what the, uh, the unfit ordinances used to commonly require, and if you have an old ordinance, your ordinance may still say this. Um, they used to require that the code enforcement officer, um, if it finds a violation, issue to the property owner finding a violation and then the property owner could appeal that to the code enforcement officer and the code enforcement officer would hold a hearing and would have to take evidence and do all these types of things and then would issue a ruling. A lot of code enforcement officers don't like that and the reason is because it puts the code enforcement officer in the position of being both a, uh, the prosecutor and also the person who determines or, or basically the prosecutor and the judge at the same time. Also, it requires the prosecutor to understand how to conduct um, a fair uh, hearing, which is something that's not necessarily in the code enforcement officer's training. Um, so the new mechanism, the code enforcement officer, is really just the prosecutor. And you're going to file the action, and it's going to go to either the magistrate or the municipal judge or to your superior court. The way it works is you file a complaint, and then you serve notice of the complaint on 
the property owner as well as people residing there and the property itself. And um, you know they get notice and hearing, and then at that hearing, there is um, if the judge finds that the, the violations do render the property unfit, the judge orders the um, the property owner to fix the problem. So this is another situation where the um, local government is, or excuse me, this is a situation where the municipal court or the magistrate court has essentially injunctive power. They have that judge has the authority to require the person to fix the problem. If they don't do it, then the local government would be authorized to fix the problem, whether that means you know, fixing up a minor issue or actually um, tearing the house down, or it may be that um, the property, the problem can be fixed in another way. I'll give you an example. Um, I, I do um, health department um, enforcement actions. So those actions oftentimes deal with failing septic tanks. Now, first we try to get the property owner to fix the problem. But if they won't, there are a couple things that we could do. One, we could go fix our septic tank system, but that would be a big expense. There's an easier way for us to fix that. We can just turn their water off. If we turn their water off, then there's not going to be more septic issues there. So um, likewise, in this situation, it may be that you can fix the problem just by uh, preventing someone from residing there or from turning the water and power off, things of that nature. If you ultimately decide that you have to do work on the property, whether it be demolition or uh, you know, construction or whatever, um, then you are allowed to put that as a lien against the property and the tax department ultimately, well, the tax department is supposed to enforce it and collect the money, but if it's not collected that way, you also could ultimately have a sheriff's sale on the property, foreclose on the lien, and uh, sell the property. Hopefully you could find someone who would come in, buy the property, pay off your cost of demolition, and then actually make something positive out of that property. One thing that is very, very important with this, and uh, um, people often say, well, the problem we have is that we can't, we can't find the owner of this property. Maybe it's a bank that's out of state. Maybe someone has passed away and their heirs all are gone. We can't find anyone. The unfit property ordinance allows you to file these actions in an in rem fashion. In rem is a, a term of art, a legal term, which means against the property. Meaning the unfit property lawsuit is not precisely against the property owner, it is against the property itself. Now, now you have to give notice to the property owner and the residents, but you don't have to serve them personally. Now, you all may be familiar that generally in any lawsuit in Georgia, you have to um, you have to serve the defendant by having the sheriff or someone who's appointed actually hand deliver a copy of the complaint to that person. Well, that's not the case with an unfit property action. In an unfit property action, you're going to mail by certified mail a copy of the complaint to any one who you know or can you, you can find who has an ownership interest. But as to everybody else, you can notify them. For instance, anyone who you can't find, you can notify them by running an ad in the newspaper. You have to post a sign on the building giving notice of the lawsuit and the hearing date. And you have to file what's called a Liz Pendens. A Liz Pendens is a document that you file in the, in the uh, deed records for the county they give notice that there's a lawsuit pending. Uh, Liz Pendens uh, literally means lawsuit pending. There's a lawsuit pending. Why do we have that? Well, if anyone is going to go buy that property, they're going to do a title search, probably, or their attorney is going to do a title search, and he'll find that Liz Pendens, and that notice will let him know that if they buy this property, they're buying a lawsuit. And generally, people won't buy a property that has a Liz Pendens filed on it, and more importantly, banks will not lend money um, 
where there is a Liz Pendens file. So it can be very effective in getting uh, people's attention and getting problems resolved, particularly if it's a bank. For instance, you've got a bank that owns uh, the property by virtue of foreclosure. If you file Liz Pendens on it, they're not going to get that property sold until they get the problem fixed. So by doing that, you have given notice to the world that you filed this action. You've posted the complaint on the building itself, so you've given notice to the building, to the property, and anybody who's residing there. And you've tried to mail to whoever you can find, for instance, whoever has a, uh, who's registered as the owner for, for the tax records. You've tried to notify everyone you can, even if you do not get the actual property owner properly served or personally served, you're going to be able to go forward with this unfit property action. Um, so that's really important if you've got a situation, as I said, where you can't find somebody who will take responsibility. Ultimately, the local government may have to do it themselves, but they can get relief, ultimately. And, and Brandon, uh, Cheryl, fans all just wanted to be clear on this. Now, what happens if you go to court and the owner is required to demolish, however, he or she just simply does not have the money to safely demolish, and therefore it just continues to sit? Yeah. Well, again, you know, we, um, you can't get blood from a turnip. We all know that. And if someone does not have the means to fix the problem, you can't really make them fix it. Uh, that's why under this, uh, under this lawsuit, or under, excuse me, under this statute and the ordinance you adopt with it, if they can't fix the problem in the time provided by the judge, then ultimately the local government is going to be able to do it themselves. And the cost of that will be placed as a lien against the property. So say it costs you $10,000 to tear a house down. Um, you've got a $10,000 lien against the property. If that property ever sells, in order for the, the purchaser to get clean title, that lien is going to have to be paid off. And if you choose, you can foreclose on the lien yourself. Now, commonly, the lien would be secondary to uh, a mortgage that were on the property. So if someone had a $100,000 debt on the property and then you um, incur $10,000 in a lien to, uh, uh, to fix the property, that lien will be secondary to that mortgage. So in that circumstance, you may not be able to foreclose on the lien because in order to do that, you've got to pay the bank off first. But uh, you can leave the lien there, and if the property ever does sell, um, if the purchase price is, if it's going to be sold for more than the lien, it's, well, in either way, ultimately, you ought to be able to get the money back through the sale of the property. To oversimplify that. But, um, but sometimes I think you just have to look at this as a cost of doing business as well. And if your jurisdiction wants to have areas that are clean, they're just going to have to recognize that it does have costs, and that may in include, you know, the cost of demolishing junk houses where we can't find anyone to otherwise to fix the problem, and the property isn't worth what it costs to, to clean it up. Uh, Brandon, I know you you need to move on, but one other question we received: uh, What if the demolition costs are actually more than the property is valued at? Does that make any difference? It does make a difference in that um, your lien is probably not ever going to be paid back, or at least not in the amount. If the property is worth $1,000 and it costs 10000 to demolish it, um, and the local government chooses to do the demolition, then that lien is probably not ever going to be fully repaid. It might The $1,000 of it might be repaid, but not the full amount. And so you just have to look at that as a cost of doing business. And is that an amount that your local government wants to pay to try to have a cleaner city? Um, if you're trying to make the argument to your city council that it should, then I would encourage you to look at the costs associated with the um, reduced tax values for the surrounding properties that are caused by having that blighted property. Uh, if it's a, being used as a drug house, uh, what, is, what are the increased costs to your city for, for law enforcement? Um, things of that nature to try to show how, in the long run, maybe the cost of demolition isn't so bad or isn't so high. But yeah, there, you definitely could end up in a situation if you're doing demolition where your money's not getting paid back.
All right. Um, the last issue I wanted to talk about uh, was the new foreclosure registry law. And I imagine some of you have a foreclosure registry ordinance. Um, this is something that is a product of the current or the recession that began in 2007, 2008, um, with large numbers of foreclosures and particularly banks that are not local uh, who are uh, acquiring property by, by virtue of foreclosure. Many of them uh, held security deeds in the name of a company called Mears Mortgage Electronic Registration Systems. And so um, that is a system or a company that makes it convenient for banks that are transferring loans around to keep track of their security interests. But it does not make it very easy for local governments to find out who owns these properties. Uh, and a, a problem that's out there that you may have experienced is commonly uh, a bank forecloses on a house, um, the property owner isn't there, and no one buys it. So it's a matter of how do you find out who owns the property. Um, commonly, at least you know, earlier, uh, these, and particularly before um, the, 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 the county clerk's, superior court clerk's authority's website became up to date, commonly you wouldn't find out about the foreclosure or who the property was sold to for months even after the foreclosure took place. So a code enforcement officer can have a very difficult time finding someone. Of course, once the property owner gets a notice of foreclosure, they have zero to no interest in, uh, in actually trying to um, maintain the property. And one problem that I've seen time and again is um, banks will send a foreclosure notice but not actually foreclose. You know, you send the notice that says, we're going to sell your property on the courthouse steps, but they actually have to go through the process of going to the courthouse steps and standing out there and, and selling the property. And I have seen on a number of occasions where they don't do that. So the property owner thinks their property has been foreclosed upon. They may leave the property. They may not leave the property. But in either case, they don't think it's their house anymore. But it, the property itself wasn't foreclosed on. Or maybe it is foreclosed on and there's, there were no records filed showing who the current owner is. So uh, a number of jurisdictions started adopting ordinances requiring foreclosures to be registered. DeKalb County was really the leader in this, I think. And they uh, drafted an ordinance that really um, required or put some pretty burdensome requirements on banks so that the uh, county and the code enforcement officers could find the bank that was responsible for the property now. Um, that caused you know, a big upcry or outcry from the banks and from the real estate market. So the result was a couple of years ago a law was passed, which is this OCGA 44-14-14, which I've got uh, on your, uh, I've got pulled up right now. It specifically allows local governments to uh, adopt ordinances that um, require registration of foreclosures and vacant properties, but it, it, it uh, preempts any other registration. So if you had an ordinance requiring registration that you adopted three years ago, it has been preempted. And if you want to have this, you've got to, you've got to adopt a new ordinance that complies strictly with what this statute says. Um, Okay, the first thing that happens is a lot of folks wonder whether or not this applies to their property, particularly landlords. The landlord is always concerned, well, what if my tenant moves out and it, uh, I don't get someone right back in there? Do I have to register my property? And the answer to that is no, generally, because the definition of vacant property is designed to exclude that situation. Real property is defined, or excuse me, Vacant property is defined as property intended for habitation, but which has not been inhabited for 60 days, has no evidence of utility usage, and is not actively being marketed for sale or rent. So the landlord who is uh, doesn't have a tenant but still has the power on, uh, still is actively marketing the property, that's not vacant property. It's just uninhabited. So they would not have to register. Um, but property 
and I, I've seen this a number of times where you've got a house that was started in 2007 and the builder lost his house with the economy um, and so you've got a partially constructed house that would require registration. A property that is owned by virtue solely of a foreclosure, say the bank forecloses, commonly in foreclosures the bank just takes the property back. So um, they would be required to register. It does specifically exclude multifamily structures where any one unit is being inhabited. So we're really talking about single family residences here. All right. If, if you adopt an ordinance requiring registration, this is the information that you can require them to give. Um, who the owner is, a local agent who's responsible for the property, the address, the transfer date, and recording info. In other words, the deed book and page number so that you can verify that they acquired the property. You can't require any more than that as far as registration goes. Um, the ordinance has to give the owner at least 90 days to file. Um, if they file, a, uh, give your jurisdiction a copy of a deed that has been filed with the clerk of the Superior Court that contains all that information we just talked about, um, then, then, then they don't have to pay a fee. Now, I'm going to go back to the slide. Listing all this information, um, you may not have had an occasion to look at a deed recently, but deeds never have all this information on there. Um, generally, it just says from so-and-so to so-and-so, period. That's it. No address, no phone number, no fax number, no email. Um, commonly, it doesn't even have an, e uh, an address of the property. It, it said it has a legal description, which may or may not include the address. Um, so that's information that would not normally be on the deed. So far, I have not seen evidence that deeds are being drafted differently than the way they have traditionally been drafted to include that information. But if anybody is out there who, who has, has one of these ordinances and has had someone give them a deed that does have this information, I'd be interested and I'd like for you to let us know that. Um, you can require a fee for the registration of no more than $100. Uh, the theory being um, obviously maintaining the registry is a cost on the local government. Um, the cost of uh, enforcing as to these properties that don't, uh, that are hard to find the owner of, these foreclosed properties, imposes a cost on the jurisdiction. Um, but the law prohibits the fee from being greater than $100 per registration. Uh, and it does provide that if someone fails to register and you cite them for failing to do so, the fine can be no more than $1,000. Important thing about this uh, foreclosure registry statute, it is not self-effectuating, meaning you cannot require uh, registration unless you actually adopt an ordinance and it has to have administrative procedures as well. This is another situation where I believe both GMA and ACCG do have a, a model ordinance that tracks this statute. So if you want this, that's something that you can get pretty easily um, and I'd be happy to provide it as well. So, um, With that said, I have come to the end of, my, of the seminar. I'd be happy to answer any other questions that are out there. Well, Brandon, we have not uh, received any others. Several along the way have asked if they can get a copy of your PowerPoint. And I wanted to make everyone aware that this webinar today has been recorded and it will be posted on the Georgia Initiative for Community Housing website. And I'm sure Karen Tinsley will be emailing everyone uh, some information about when that becomes available. Also, for those, uh, Brandon, who would just like to have a copy of their PowerPoint and not necessarily hear the presentation, would it be possible for you to send that to us as well so we could post that as a link? Absolutely. Yeah, once okay. we get off the uh, phone bill, I'll send this over to you. Okay. Well, all of you then can expect to see that in the very, very near future. Uh, we did, during the webinar, ask you several questions, took little polls, and you might be interested to know what the responses were. Um, one question was, do your, does your jurisdiction have an unfit property ordinance? And 65% of you said yes, while 
35% said no. And then just um, more recently, uh, we asked, does your jurisdiction have a foreclosure and vacant property registration a registry ordinance? And uh, just a small percentage, 21% said yes, while 79% said no. So clearly, a lot of jurisdictions are still looking at that. And so, uh, Brandon, your suggestion that GMA and ACCG is among yourself can be helpful in that regard was a point well made. So please let us know how we can be helpful. Uh, if there are no further questions, we're going to bring the webinar to a conclusion. Again, thank all of you for taking time to participate today. Uh, for those of you who will be in Rome for the workshop next week, we look forward to seeing you. And as always, please let us know if you have any questions or if we can be of assistance. And again, Brandon, thank you so much for your time. A very informative presentation today. Very welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you. We'll be in touch with everyone soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.